Good morning and good afternoon. My name is Tracy Cook and I'm with SACS Healthcare Communications. Before I introduce our moderator, Angela Craig, and our speaker, Nicole Kupchuk, I'd like to show our audience how to send in questions and comments. Our moderator for today is Angela Craig. Angela is a clinical nurse specialist at Cookville Regional Medical Center in Cookville, Tennessee. She has been a clinical nurse specialist for over 25 years and the last 15 years has been in the 28 bed ICU at CRMC. She has chaired a hospital sepsis team and led them to the first sepsis disease specific certified hospital in the state of Tennessee. Additionally, she is on the Sepsis Alliance Advisory Board. She has worked with the area nursing homes, long-term care facilities, home health care, and EMS to increase early identification of potential infections and effective interventions. Angela, welcome. Thank you, Tracy, for that kind introduction. Good morning, good afternoon, depending on where you're located. We are excited to share with you today the title of today's webinar is surviving sepsis, what does it take? Speaking today on this very timely topic is our outstanding speaker, Nicole Kupchik. Nicole is a clinical nurse specialist. She is a founder of an award-winning sepsis program, currently an independent consultant, and an author, author excuse me, of multiple certification review books, also the author of the Critical Care Survival Guide. If you haven't got it, get it, it's awesome. Author of numerous published papers and a contributing editor of AJN on ECG Strip Savvy. As far as disclosure, uh, the following relationships uh, Nicole has, she's on the Speakers Bureau for Stryker and Baxter Healthcare, and she's also a consultant for Baxter Healthcare. We have continuing education for nurses, respiratory therapists, and EMS professionals. This educational activity is approved for one contact hour. A link to obtain CE credits will be available at the conclusion of the webinar. And below are the accreditation statements. And a thank you uh, for um, support for this educational activity um, by Stryker. And now, without further ado, I'd like to introduce to you our speaker, Nicole Kupchik. Thanks, Angela. Ha ha good morning, afternoon, whatever time it is to everyone. I'm, I'm really excited to talk about this topic, surviving sepsis, what does it take? Because the reality is it takes a village to, um, you know, to really improve survival and improve outcomes. You know, it's starting with EMS or even public awareness of the signs of sepsis all the way to the emergency department and inpatient at hospitals. It really truly does take a village. All right, so we're gonna talk about the most recent surviving sepsis guidelines and updates. We're gonna talk about early warning signs of sepsis. And we're gonna analyze just like, what does it take? Like, what are the therapies we need to focus on, especially early? So if you weren't aware, September is actually Sepsis Awareness Month. And I want to say, I want to give a huge shout out to the Sepsis Alliance. The Sepsis Alliance is a nonprofit organization that just really dedicates so many resources to educating not only the public, but also healthcare providers as well. So please check them out if you haven't yet. Um, or make a donation. They're an amazing nonprofit organization that really, really is trying to change the world of sepsis. Okay, so with that, we're going to kick it off and we're going to talk about statistics and just to kind of get an idea of like, what is the prevalence of this and what are the outcomes in sepsis? So here are some facts just to kind of start with. So sepsis is the leading cause and cost of death in U.S. hospitals. I mean, let that sink in. You might have a patient who comes in for some other issue and maybe they get a hospital acquired infection or maybe they did come in with an infection and they end up unfortunately meeting their demise and it is very costly. Um, you know, unlike a heart attack where a patient presents, they go to the cath lab, they're home the next couple of days. Often what we see with sepsis patients is they have very extended lengths of stay. So it can be extremely costly and is the leading cause of death in hospitals. So some stats, so more than 1.7 million people are diagnosed with sepsis every year in the United States. And if you kind of break that down, that's over 32,000 people per day, over 1,300 people per hour, and over 22 people per minute. So at this point, from the time that we started this webinar, over 100 people have been diagnosed with sepsis in the United States. And the mortality, unfortunately, 
can be somewhat high. Over a quarter of a million people die every single year from sepsis. That's 5,000 people per day and about 216 people every hour. So if you think about by the time we finish this webinar, over 200 people will have died from sepsis. But if you think about just the statistics of how many people die per day, it is the equivalent of 24 plane loads of people dying every single day. I mean, that is absolutely astounding to think about. And if we actually had 24 airline planes crashing every single day, we would do a lot about that to change the outcomes. And I think that's one of the frustrating things in sepsis is it's not as obvious as a plane crash. In fact, it can be really challenging to identify. And I think that honestly, and I, you know, I've been working in the world of sepsis for 30 years as, since I've you know started my work in healthcare. And I think that's been the one thing that I just wish we would make more headway on is how do we identify sepsis? It is very, very challenging to identify it. But you know, every minute, like I was saying, 3.6 people are going to die from sepsis. So when you think about how many people die from sepsis every year, it's more than prostate cancer, breast cancer, and opioid overdoses combined. So it is extremely prevalent in our health healthcare system. And if you look like, how do different areas of the country do? Well, the um, the colors in light blue have the lowest age-adjusted mortality rates by state. So, you know, the whole entire West Coast does a little bit better. And, and maybe it's not that they're doing anything better per se, but maybe that just as a general, the population is a little bit healthier. But you can see the whole entire South and Midwest has the highest age-adjusted mortality rates in the United States. One of the things I don't feel like we talk about enough in sepsis is the long-term effects of it. Now, I could not find updated um, statistics on this, but over 10 years ago, there was a publication where they identified over 13,000 amputations related to sepsis take place in the United States every year, and that's about 38 amputations per day. I mean, you know, I have, we've all seen this clinically. Now, EMS, you may not have seen it as much, obviously, because it's something that happens later, but this is what happens down the line when patients go into shock, and this is one of the kind of the downfalls of sepsis. But this is a, um, a woman whose story was made public a few years back who had a, an elective surgical um, hysterectomy and it was done laparoscopically and she got septic. And I, you know, I think one of the super challenging things is that it's, you know, we've, it's just difficult to identify. Hindsight is always 2020. It's really easy, you know, later down the line when we've got positive blood cultures or positive cultures from any source um, that come back. But it's when you've got somebody who's in front of you right now and you're trying to figure out what's going on, it can be really challenging. But this woman, if you can imagine, had two little tiny children at home, lost both her hands and both her legs um, below the knee. And, uh, you know, and here she's made a recovery, but her life is forever changed. You know, I can't even imagine going through what she went through. But we know that there are definite long-term effects of sepsis. So up to 50% of sepsis survivors experience some post-sepsis syndrome. And with that, I will say delirium is not uncommon. Um, patients will develop delirium in the hospital. But symptoms, some um, other kind of post-sepsis syndrome symptoms include issues with cognitive function. A lot of times people end up going on disability because they can't get back to their previous state of health and cognitively have some impairment. Anxiety and panic attacks are pretty common. Um, difficulty concentrating, difficulty sleeping, and then chronic muscle and joint pain. Um, these are things patients experience once they've, you know, made it out of the hospital and we're so excited they made it out. But, you know, in the meantime, they're dealing with a lot of long-term effects of sepsis. One of the things I think we can all really help, especially, you know, this month is Sepsis Awareness Month, is think about like just teaching your neighbors or your friends that aren't in healthcare 
what some of the signs of sepsis are. And one of the statistics that's mind blowing is about 35% of US adults have never heard of sepsis. They've heard of heart attack, they've heard of stroke. We've done a lot of education on the signs of each of those, but they've never heard of sepsis, which is a massive killer in the United States. So how do you know, how do we make a difference with the public? Um, the Sepsis Alliance has an acronym called TIME. You know, is your temperature elevated or is it lower than normal? Um, do you think you've got an infection? Um, do you, are, is there mental decline? And one of the things I don't think we talk about enough is people will get just mentally really foggy and out of it when they're septic. And this is just a super quick story, but um, last fall, about a year ago, I went to Morocco for a yoga retreat and I got a really, really bad bacterial infection, a GI infection. And, um, and I was very, very sick and people kept asking me, do you need to go to the hospital? I'm like, no, 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 I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm fine. I do not remember two and a half days of the trip, like two totally do not remember the trip, but I did have enough whereabouts with me to know I need to drink as much water, but actually I got Gatorade with some electrolytes in it as possible. And I lost 11 pounds in a week, but don't worry, I found them all. So you know, not a big deal, but I mean, I was just mentally super, super out of it. And then the the um, E in time is extremely ill. You know, is your is the patient you know is the person short of breath? Do they have pain, discomfort? So these are symptoms we can teach the public to kind of pick up on. And then what we always need to have on our radar, especially EMS and the emergency department, is could this be sepsis? And another thing that's helpful is to understand who is the absolute highest risk. So it's people over the age of 65, but it's also children. Um, that are less than one. Um, people with a weakened immune system, if people have had a recent infection, their immune system is not going to be at their baseline and they're gonna be more prone to getting reinfected. People with chronic conditions like diabetes, lung disease, kidney disease, et cetera, those are all your highest risk patients. Now, a lot of onus is put on hospitals. In EM, we're gonna talk about how to identify this in EMS in just a little bit, but how do hospitals improve? Because this is where a lot of these people end up. And I think one of the biggest things is you got to pay attention and you've got to be on the hunt for sepsis. Um, sepsis affects every single area in the hospital, every service line. Patients are at risk for developing sepsis. And do you have a sepsis program? Because the CDC is actually recommending, if you don't, that you develop one. Um, there was a meta-analysis of observational studies that was published a couple of years ago. And what they found was that when hospitals had official sepsis programs, that they had better adherence to the sepsis bundles, they had a reduction in mortality, and they had better screen screening for sepsis and sepsis metrics. And so what should we focus on? Well, right now, the CMS measure for hospitals focuses on identification and early recognition. And I think that's easy to say, but again, identification can be really, really challenging to pick up on. Um, getting labs and different diagnostics. So we need to start with blood cultures, ideally before antibiotics, a CBC with a differential, a chemistry panels, lactate levels, perhaps procalcitonin. Um, getting at least a, a fluid dose into those patients, then reassessing using a dynamic measure if the patient needs additional fluid, if they're hypotensive or hypoperfused. Um, getting antibiotics started. We often will start with a broad spectrum antibiotic, and then we quickly try to narrow based on our best guess of what the source of infection is or until the blood cultures or cultures come back. Thinking about source control, if a patient's got a pus pocket or they've got a wound that needs to be drained or tapped or cleaned out, you can give antibiotics until the cows come home, but you've got to deal with the source. And then um, resuscitation. And then the biggest thing is preventing critical illness. Um, a huge thing is preventing secondary infections. One of the best, or I'm going to say two of the best things we can do for patients in the pre-hospital and hospital setting is wash your hands. Wash your hands before you give and provide any care. Now for hospitalized patients, one of the best things you can do to prevent hospital acquired pneumonia is have that patient or their family or you know, one of the team brush that patient's teeth at least twice a day to prevent hospital acquired pneumonia. And so the CDC published some data around sepsis and the CDC, I'm gonna say, is really starting to pay attention to this, but um, 
this is kind of fascinating to think about, but specifically on U.S. hospitals, 73% of hospitals have a sepsis committee, which is actually higher than I thought that was going to be. But half of hospitals, only half, provide dedicated time for sepsis program leaders. And I know when I was our sepsis coordinator, I did that in addition to Code Blue, um, covering the cath lab, critical care, progressive care, telemetry units. I mean, there was a lot on my plate, but I was so... I was very passionate about sepsis, and so I personally chose to dedicate more time to it. But you know, now it's just really important that we have dedicated sepsis leaders that have time that is just for sepsis. Um, and then half of sepsis committees involve antibiotic stewardship programs. I cannot say enough about having pharmacy involved and really making sure that we've got antibiotograms and that we are prescribing the best antibiotics for patients to cover whatever bacteria, virus, or fungal infection perhaps they may have. All right, so Tracy's gonna kick off our first poll. So the first poll I've got is this. What is the most common source of infection causing sepsis requiring hospitalization in adults? So get your votes in. All right, Tracy, do we have votes rolling in? We do, we do, Nicole. And just a reminder for everyone that you want to select the right response directly on your screen. Nicole, let's give them, how about 10 more seconds? Okay, that sounds great. I posted this one on social media yesterday and actually most people got this one wrong. So we'll see. Um, so the key is infection causing sepsis requiring hospitalization. All right, Tracy, what'd they say? Here you go. Oh, yeah, okay, so a lot of you answered how they did on social media yesterday. So a lot of you said urinary tract infection followed by skin and wound infection. Actually, the answer here is pneumonia. And a lot of urinary tract infections can be treated in the outpatient setting. And as long as it's identified early, patients can get started on antibiotics and do really well. But actually, pneumonia is the most common source of infection requiring hospitalization. Um, so you can see this is uh, from the CDC, but about 35% of patients who require hospitalization have pneumonia or some sort of a lung infection. 25% had a urinary tract infection. So it is common, but it's not the most common. 11% had some sort of a gut infection and then 11% had a skin infection. But one of the crazy things to think about is about 13% of patients never have a, a source or cause identified, which is kind of scary to think about. All right, so let's jump into a case. You've got a 58-year-old female who presents to the emergency department via EMS, who's got a productive cough, sweating, fever, and chills. She's been progressively ill over the past four days and she's drowsy. And again, pay attention to mentation because that is often something that is altered when patients are septic. Her past medical history is hypertension and hyperlipidemia. Um, she's got a MAP of 62, she's got a fever, heart rate's 115, breathing 16 a minute, and um, an SpO2 of 91% on room air. So let's kind of look at these. And if you look at the, her vital signs, she meets two of the SIRS criteria. So she's got a fever and her heart rate is 115 and she's got a productive cough, sweating, fever, and chills. So do we suspect infection? And I think anytime you've got a productive cough, the answer needs to be likely, right? So what do we wanna do? Well, obviously we wanna get some labs. So we get a lactate, a baseline procalcitonin level, get some cultures. Uh, we wanna get a CBC with a differential, a chemistry panel, and then we want to give a dose of fluid, and the first dose in the guidelines is 30 mils per, or mils per kg, and we're going to use LR, and we're going to give broad-spectrum antibiotics. Now, the CMS measure, for those of you who work in the hospital, just as an FYI, states if the patient's BMI is greater, 30 or greater, that you can use their ideal or predicted body weight to dose the fluid. All right, so we get our labs and we obviously we're thinking about what's the source. So for her, it seems like it's pneumonia. And of course, we're gonna have viral infections, flu and COVID, especially coming into the fall, is gonna be on our differential. 
or as, as on our radar for a possibility. So we get a couple of IVs started on her. She gets 30 mils per kg of LR. So she weighs 82 kgs. And so um, you could do the math on there. So it's about two and a half liters of fluid needs to go in. Her MAP was below the target. And she's got a history of hypertension. So a MAP target of 65 may not be high enough for her. And that's something we always have to think about. And we wanna get antibiotics into her. And hopefully your EMS system or hospital has an antibiotogram to cover the types of bugs that you're seeing in the community in the region where you live. So her point of care lactate comes back at 4.2. So that's consistent with shock and it's a sign of hypoperfusion. So this is a patient who is definitely, who's sick. And what the guidelines recommend is that we uh, do interventions to decrease the lactate level. And so what you want to see is as you provide interventions, like you give fluid or you start a vasopressor or a positive inotrope like dobutamine, for example, you want to see that lactate go down. And that's what's called lactate clearance. So you want to repeat the lactate once the fluid is in. So we're going to start off with fluid, but then we're going to reassess, does the patient need more fluid or do they need a vasopressor? Now around procalcitonin, what the guidelines are saying is that you shouldn't be using it to diagnose sepsis. You shouldn't be using procalcitonin levels to make a decision whether to start antibiotics. But the way we can use procalcitonin is get a baseline and then usually every other day we'll repeat the procalcitonin. And what you wanna do is with antibiotics is you wanna see that procalcitonin level decrease. And one of the things I always keep in my mind is with the procalcitonin level is if the level comes back double digits, so anything above 10, meaning you've got double trouble. And often what we'll see is, you now you can't use this to diagnose sepsis or severe sepsis or septic shock, but often when you see double digits, so 10 or above procalcitonin level, that's often associated with shock. All right, so um, SIRS are the criteria we are still using clinically. And it is my hope before I retire that we actually have better ways to identify sepsis. But SIRS criteria, so it's a temperature that goes up or down, a heart rate greater than 90, a respiratory rate greater than 20, or a, PCA, a PACO2 of less than 32, um, a white count that's elevated or decreased, or bands that are elevating. And so if your patient has at least two of these, and you suspect infection, that is the current diagnosis of sepsis. But then you might be thinking, oh gosh, a lot of my patients have a fast heart rate and they're breathing fast. And let's be honest, like if I were to go run up 10 flights of stairs, would I meet SIRS criteria? The answer is absolutely. But the question, do you suspect an infection is kind of what guides us next. Now that seems like an easy question to answer on paper, but clinically that can be a really challenging question to answer. So the problem with these criteria is that you see them in lots of patients. They are sensitive, but they're not specific to sepsis. But these are still the criteria we are clinically using. And like I said, I hope we come up with something better by the time I retire. But two SIRS or more plus an infection is the current diagnosis of sepsis. And the problem, so when you look at SIRS criteria in inpatients, um, there was a study that's published a couple of years back looking at over a quarter of a million patients. And what they found is that almost half of patients met two or more SIRS criteria at some point during their hospital stay. Um, and then by about the 96 hour mark of, uh, of admission to the hospital, almost 70% of patients meet SIRS criteria, but they don't have an infection. So I think the problem with the criteria, again, is that they're sensitive, but they're not specific to sepsis. And that creates a lot of alarm fatigue, especially if you're having to manually screen patients, or if you've got some dynamic way using your documentation system, this can create a lot of alarm fatigue. All right, here's our next poll. So Tracy, you ready to launch the poll? I am Nicole, here we go. Okay, so which of the SIRS criteria is, uh, the criteria is the most predictive of clinical decompensation? Is it heart rate, respiratory rate, temperature, or white count? So get your votes in. 
All right, Tracy, your vote's rolling in. They are, and again, just a reminder, you wanna vote directly on your screen. Nicole, I think we need about 10 more seconds with this one as well. Okay, sounds great. All right, what did you guys say? Oh, you got it right. Okay, so 34% of you said respiratory rate, and that actually is the answer, and it's gonna be followed by heart rate. Okay. All right, so let's talk about this. Let's talk about some data behind this. So this was a study that was published a few years back that demonstrated, they, they screened, literally, this is out of the University of Chicago, screened millions and millions of patients, just kind of crunched big data. What they found is that respiratory rate was definitely the most predictive, and you can see by far the most predictive of clinical decompensation. And if you think about it, well, that kind of makes sense, right? If I'm septic, you often build acid, your lactic acid or lactate levels are elevated. How do you get rid of acid? You blow it off. But here's the problem. So here's the big problem with that, is how do we measure the respiratory rate, either in the pre-hospital setting or hospital? And the answer is you don't, we make it up, right? So, I mean, how many of you have ever eyeballed it? You don't have to answer this, uh, you know, realistically, but how many of you have ever eyeballed a patient? You're like, ah, 16, 16, 18, 16, right? I, I can tell you the hospital I worked at where I ran the sepsis program, they were a 16 or hospital. And um, I would always see this in the EMS and the ED documentation where we're 16, 16, 18, 16. Now, what was interesting is this patient that I had introduced to you her respiratory rate was documented, I think it was at 16. She had pneumonia. I won't tell you, when you've got pneumonia, you do not breathe 16. But this was a study that was published where uh, basically what happened was a, a research um, assistant went in with a nurse into a patient's room and the nurse did not know why the, the, the assistant, the researcher was going into the room with them. And what happened was they, the researcher would physically count the respirations and then compare that to what the nurse documented. And all I'm gonna say is the margin of error was absolutely huge. You know, the, so patients were breathing a lot faster than nurses were documented. And so there are so many memes about this. It's like when you write 16 respirations, but don't count them, Christ is watching, you know? So, so we know, but I have to say like in the setting of sepsis, especially, you know, count six seconds, multiply by 10, you're gonna have a way better accurate uh, you know, respiratory rate. And it's not that patients are necessarily dysmic, they're often silently tachypnic because they're blowing off acid. So this is a really cool study that was done in the pre-hospital setting using the four SIRS, well actually it would be three SIRS criteria out in the pre-hospital setting. So heart rate, respiratory rate, and temperature. And then they added end tidal CO2. So if the patient met at least two SIRS criteria, they would add end tidal CO2 if they thought the patient had an infection. So if there was a suspicion of infection, they add an entitle. And if they had two or more criteria plus an entitle of 25 or less, they would activate, and they suspected infection, they would activate a sepsis alert when the patient got to the hospital. And by adding, if you think about it, if your entitle CO2, normal being 35 to 45, if your entitle is less than 25, how are you breathing? You're breathing fast. You're blowing off your CO2. And so anyway, um, what they found was when they added end tidal CO2 um, to the surge criteria, it got it right 99% of the time. So they were actually sepsis, appropriate sepsis alerts. So I think this is fascinating. And I know EMS is so good about using capnography in the field. But I'll tell you, in the hospital, we've got a lot of room in, for improvement in really utilizing capnography in a lot of different clinical situations. Now, where on the body is the best place to assess for perfusion? And the answer is the knees. And there's um, since like 12 years ago, we've had this, um, this scoring tool that's been clinically validated where you assess at the kneecap and you look how high above the patient's knee, you see modeling. And I will tell you, when you see modeling up into the groin, that's associated with a very high mortality. But this was a score that was validated, so it's called the knee modeling score, where they looked at all different types of clinical criteria. And what they found is that um, lactate levels, urine output, and modeling score were the most predictive of 14-day mortality. But of the top three, modeling 
the knee modeling was actually the most predictive of 14 day mortality. All right, so maybe when you think about how we identify sepsis, maybe we need a different approach. And so in the pre-hospital setting, it probably still makes sense to use the surge criteria. Same thing in the ED. I will tell you in hospital, we also use it as well. But like I was saying, I hope, you know, long-term we find something that's a bit better. But there's different scoring tools. So there's the SOFA score, the sequential organ failure assessment. There's the sepsis early warning system, modified early warning system. There's SIRS, there's QSOFA. But maybe what we should be doing is using our data that we document. Because I always say, where do data go to die? <laughs> your documentation systems, your EHRs, right? But maybe if we had programs that were smarter and we used artificial intelligence, we could maybe look at like the delta change in vital signs. So let's say your heart rate was 78 and now it's up to 90. Maybe that change in heart rate is more predictive than the heart rate itself. And so, and this is where a lot of work is being done is to see, you know, just crunching million and millions and millions of data points of like, what do septic patients look like? And my hope is that we really can use the data or putting into charts in our EHRs, we can use that data to identify septic patients, but the data needs to be correct. And the biggest room improvement for improvement is the respiratory rate. Really, we've got to start documenting and, and actually looking more critically at respiratory rates. Now, something that's on the horizon that's actually showing some promise is what it's called MDW or monocyte distribution width. And this is a point that's on your differential on your <clears throat> CBC or complete blood cell count. And what we're finding is that when patients are infected or people are infected, it doesn't matter if it's viral, bacterial, or fungal, is that monocytes are activated. And what the data are showing so far on the CBC is that when your MDW or monocyte distribution width is 20 or above, that can differentiate sepsis from non-sepsis. Because let's be honest, a lot of times we have patients who are inflamed. Like for example, one of the things that we would always see that were kind of false alerts for our code sepsis work was pancreatitis. Because pancreatitis, you've got a massive inflammation. And so maybe in the future, we can use MDW, which can be readily obtained from your CBC to identify, huh, maybe this patient actually is septic. And where MDW is showing the most promise is it's showing the most promise as ruling patients out. So it's a negative predictor. Um, in fact, it's got 94% negative predictability. So, you know, we might be able to say, ooh, we don't think it's sepsis in this patient. So stay tuned. The, there, there's a mounting just, you know, literature to support MDW. So stay tuned on that one. So obviously, wouldn't it be helpful in the pre-hospital setting, but in the hospital setting, it, will, it is. All right, so the next thing we're talking about is fluid. You need to think about fluid as a drug. Fluids are drugs. And how many times, you know, would you ever give insulin without understanding a patient's, what their glucose was? Or would you ever titrate norepinephrine without knowing what the patient's blood pressure was? The answer is no. In the same way that you check a glucose before giving insulin or check a blood pressure before titrating norepinephrine, you should be understanding if your patient is going to be fluid responsive. And what I mean by that is when you give a bolus of fluid in the setting of hypotension or hypoperfusion, what do you want to see? The answer is you want to see the stroke volume increase. So you want to see the amount of blood that's ejected with each heartbeat actually increase. So we should be measuring stroke volume. Okay, so let me just, let's talk about fluid though first. So your patient, so we're going to launch another, uh, another um, poll here. So your patient is hypotensive and, is, and the team is confident that the patient needs fluid. What type of fluid would you anticipate needing to hang on your unit or in your EMS system? So what type, what do you think you would get an order for? Saline, LR, plasma IA, or albumin? Not what do you want to see an order for, but what do you think you would actually get an order for? So get your votes in. All right, Tracy, how's it going? 
It is going good. I think this one again needs 10 seconds. Nicole? Okay, sounds good. Get your votes in. All right, what'd they say, Tracy? Ah, most of you are saying saline. Yeah, so saline, I know I'm just gonna challenge you to not call it normal saline ever again once you hear the data behind it, yeah. So a lot of us have made this big kind of transition to LR and let's talk about why. So why? Well, there have been a couple of studies published, uh, not a couple, quite a few studies published, comparing LR or plasma light A, which are considered balanced fluid, to saline. And um, so saline, what we're finding because of all the chloride in it um, is leading to a higher incidence of acute kidney injury. Um, and this has been studied in the emergency uh, department. It's been studied in inpatient side critical care as well. And the problem with saline is A, the fluid itself is acidic. The pH of saline is only 5.6, but it contains a ton of sodium and a lot of chloride. And the hyperchloremia we think is leading to renal vasoconstriction, which is leading to reduced renal blood flow and kidney injury. And it's also causing a secondary acidosis. And so what the sepsis guidelines are actually recommending is that you use a balanced fluid over saline. And so a lot of us, that's why we've made the big switch. Now, specifically, one, one study looked at patients, they did a post hoc analysis of septic patients. So they evaluated over 1,600 patients um, who had sepsis looking at LR, or I'm sorry, balanced fluid versus saline. And what they found is patients who received, who were septic, who received saline had a higher 30 day mortality. They had a, um, the patients who got balanced fluid had a lower incidence of kidney um, injury within 30 days. Um, patients who got balanced fluid had a higher number of vasopressor free days. And they also had a higher number of renal replacement therapy or dialysis free days. So saline led to higher mortality, balanced fluid, we saw less kidney injury, less vasopressors and less dialysis needs. So that would be like LR or plasma A. So I know we would always jokingly would call, you know, when we resuscitate patients, they often get very, very swollen. So we call them like saltwater drownings when saline was given, right? So sorry, don't mean to keep distant on the saline, but again, there's nothing normal about it. It's got a pH of 5.6 and it has got 900 milligrams per 100 mils of fluid. So if you do the math on that, each liter of saline's got about nine grams of sodium, and that's the equivalent to about 32 of those little itty bitty snack size bags of Lay's potato chips. So there's a lot of, of salt in or sodium in saline. And again, the problem with excessive chloride is that it leads to kidney injury. So I think the bottom line, what we're seeing in the literature is that saline is leading to kidney injury and a higher incidence of the, for the need of dialysis. All right, the next thing we're talking about is how many times clinically have you been in a situation where you're trying to decide, I've got a hypotensive or hypoperfused patient, do I give more fluid or do I start a vasopressor? Because if you start a vasopressor and the patient gets hospitalized, what unit do they need to go to? critical care? And do we all have issues with availability of critical care beds? And the answer is absolutely. So when, you, when you're giving fluid for somebody who's hypotensive or hypoperfused, you, you're trying to gauge like, where are they on their startling curve? If they're at the bottom of the curve, which most patients are when they first present with sepsis, they're usually on the bottom part of that curve. It's pretty easy. We give volume and that's why we always start with volume, 30 mils per kilo. But the problem is, is after you give that first dose of fluid, you don't know where they are on that curve. So if you're only using heart rate and blood pressure, you have no idea where they are on that starling curve. And so what you want to know is when you give a fluid bolus, does the stroke volume increase? That's what you want to know. The purpose of giving a fluid bolus is to increase the patient's stroke volume or the amount of blood that's ejected with each beat. And so what we're starting to do now is we're starting to use stroke volume, non-invasive stroke volume measurements or capnography at the bedside and combining that with the passive leg raise test. And if the patient can't have the passive leg raise test, we can just give a small amount of fluid, like 300 mils of fluid in less than a few minutes. And what's interesting, and we keep seeing this data over and over and over again in the literature, is that once a patient gets their 
first dose of fluids, that 30 mils per gig of fluid, once they get that first dose of fluid, about half of patients don't need additional fluid because their stroke volume will not increase when fluid is given. And we know when we under resuscitate patients, so when we don't give them enough fluid, patients die and they die quickly, right? They get tissue hyperperfusion, they can have organ failure, they can have circulatory collapse, which can lead to death. But what we are seeing far more frequently is over resuscitation. We give way too much fluid. And the problem in sepsis is there's a big inflammatory response. So capillaries become leaky, patients third space a lot of fluid that ends up that which causes a lot of swelling, it leads to ARDS, they end up needing more mechanical ventilation, kidney injury, intra-abdominal hypertension, patients are more at risk of delirium, which leads to, I will say, the slow, torturous death when patients get over uh, resuscitated. So one of the things is you wanna give just enough fluid in sepsis and not a drop more. So what the guidelines are recommending is that when um, in adults with severe, with sepsis or septic shock, that they actually suggest using a dynamic measure to guide fluid resuscitation over a physical examination or static measures alone. So things like heart rate and blood pressure, or uh, central venous pressure, are considered static measures. So the question is, do you want to guess it using heart rate and blood pressure? You're guessing if they need fluid, or do you actually want to assess it? So guess it or assess it. And so what should we be using as a stroke volume measure? Things like ultrasound. So they might look at the inferior vena cava collapsibility, um, bioreactance, which is a non-invasive uh, way to measure stroke volume. Uh, there's different digit cardiac output and stroke volume devices that can be used. Uh, once the patient is an inpatient, maybe we'll put in an art line and look for um, either changes in stroke volume with a passive leg raise test, or we can measure stroke volume variability or pulse pressure variability. Or maybe if you've got an advanced system, you can look at things like EA Dyne and DP over DT. Um, we can use esophageal probes to assess, you know, um, stroke volume or end tidal CO2. So there are different things we can use combined with the passive leg raise test or a very rapid dose of fluid to see if the patient's stroke volume increases. So we want to optimize their stroke volume. But the data are really clear. Heart rate and blood pressure are not predictive of fluid or preload responsiveness. So the passive leg raise test, the way to do this is with the patient's head of the bed up 45 degrees and their legs straight, you wanna get a baseline stroke volume or a baseline capnography reading. So head of the bed up, legs straight. So get your baseline reading. And then what you wanna do is you wanna rapidly drop the patient's head and passively, this is really important, passively lift their legs for about one to two to three minutes. And what you're doing is you're taking the blood volume from their legs and lower abdomen and you're pushing it back toward the heart. So you're using the patient's own blood volume as a fluid challenge, fluid challenge, um, and challenging the heart to see what's gonna happen to their stroke volume. And if the stroke volume increases by 10% or more, or if the capnography increases by 5% or more, that predicts the patient will be a fluid responder, that they will respond to fluid. Now, it doesn't tell you how much fluid they need, but it just predicts that they will be fluid responsive. So again, with a stroke volume, you want to see a 10% or more increase to say, yeah, let's get more fluid. Um, whereas with capnography, it's 5% or more. All right, so now we're back to our case. So we gave our patient two and a half liters over an hour. Uh, they got their IV antibiotics, cultures are pending. We gave them some acetaminophen because they were febrile. After the fluid, we repeated a lactate and it's down from 4.2 to 3.8. It's heading in the right direction, but I would have liked to have seen a bigger drop. And we, we aren't there yet. We're still kind of in the shock uh, kind of zone. The patient does have modeling bilaterally on their knees up to their mid thighs, so that's not good. So we repeat our vital signs and the MAP is 60. So the question is, are, do I need to do something? And the answer is absolutely. Uh, their lactate is still elevated, their MAP is only 60, the heart rate is fast. Um, so we need to do something. All right, so the question we're always asking when we're trying to decide fluid presser is, is our patient hypotensive or hypoperfused? So what we did um, on this patient was we 
placed a stroke volume device, non-invasive stroke volume device on the patient. And we got a baseline with the head of the bed up, leg straight, we got a baseline. And their baseline stroke volume index was 48 mils per beat per meter squared. So then what we did was we dropped the patient's head and we lifted the legs. And after two and a half minutes, the stroke volume index went from 48 to 56. And that was a 16.6% increase in the stroke volume. So in the setting of hypotension, with a stroke volume index increase of 16%, what does this patient need? It, this is predictive that they're going to respond to more fluid. How much more fluid? I mean, we have to kind of take our best guess at that, but it just is predicting that their stroke volume is going to increase if fluid is given. So we need to give more fluid in this case. So we give a 500 mil bolus of LR over 20 minutes and we reassess the vital signs 25 minutes later. So the question is, is this patient hypotensive or hypoperfused? Well, the math is 63. So we're still not at our target, especially in a patient who's chronically hypertensive. So we're gonna um, get a baseline with the head of the bed up, the legs straight, and our baseline stroke volume index is 40. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna drop the head and we're gonna lift the legs. And this time, the change in their stroke volume index was only 4.3%. So that actually predicts that the patient is no longer gonna respond to fluid. So what should we do now? We should start norepinephrine. So norepinephrine would be our next step. I don't think they need dobutamine because their cardiac index is 2.8. So it doesn't look like they need dobutamine, but they do need a presser to improve their MAP. And so this whole idea of using stroke volume change with the passive leg raise test has actually been validated in observational studies and in a randomized control trial. And a couple of years ago, uh, this was actually published in right at the beginning of the pandemic in June of 2020. And using that the same kind of algorithm I just decided, is your patient hypotensive or hypoperfused? Um, you do a passive leg raise test. If their stroke volume goes up by 10% or more, you're going to give volume. If it doesn't, you're gonna start or increase a vasopressor. And what the outcomes from this randomized control trial study showed was that patients got less fluid when a stroke volume measure and stroke volume changes were assessed compared to using things like heart rate and blood pressure. So they got less volume and it was statistically significant. Um, other things they found when using stroke volume measure to predict fluid responsiveness is that the rate of dialysis or renal replacement therapy was 17.5% in the group that didn't have a stroke volume measure but it was only 5% when we use stroke volume to decide if our patient needs volume. Uh, mechanical ventilation was cut by almost half, actually it was cut by half when a stroke volume measure was used. Let that sink in for a minute. Mechanical ventilation was cut by half when a stroke volume measure was used because these patients didn't get fluid overloaded. Um, ICU length of stay was not statistically significant, but they shaved off three days when a stroke volume measure were, was used. That is definitely financially and rel it's very relevant uh, to the clinical setting. And then a, an exploratory measure in this study was looking at discharges home. And what they found is you were more likely to go home versus a rehab facility or extended care facility when a stroke volume measure was used. So you know, I think we really need to rethink how we're reassessing fluid needs because we know fluid overload is not benign. We know it's not benign. And the, I, again, the idea is you need to give just enough fluid and not a drop more. Now, vasopressors um, should, you know, you really need to think about starting them early because if you think about physiologically, what's happening with sepsis is they're significantly vaso dilated. How do you tighten up the vasculature? You use a vasopressor. Um, but the one thing I want to warn you on is just if you're going to start norepinephrine and you're escalating the doses, you need to think about adding a second vasopressor early. The one that we most commonly use is vasopress in. And you may have noticed in the guidelines, they drop the starting dose to 0.03 units per minute from 0.04. And the reason was gut ischemia. So, you know, what we want to do is you want to Ideally, if you can, keep your vasopressor doses at bay and use a second line vasopressor. And vasopressin is a totally different 
um, type of vasopressor. It acts on your vasopressin 1 and vasopressin 2 receptors. So it causes vasoconstriction, but it um, helps the patient hold on to sodium and water to elevate the blood pressure. And if there's cardiac dysfunction, because often there is in sepsis, think about starting dobutamine or switching to epinephrine if you need that beta-1 stimulation um, for uh, cardiac dysfunction. And again, you, you know, I have to say, you find cardiac dysfunction when you go looking for it. And this is why echoes are really helpful, you know, in patients, especially if they're in a shock state. So what's on the horizon? You know, I'm really excited to see what happens with AI and predictive algorithms to identify patients, especially in acute care units in, in hospital, you know, in patients who are hospitalized. Timing of vasopressors, the literature is starting to point to the direction of we probably should be starting them a heck of a lot earlier. There was a brand new study published on using methylene blue with norepinephrine, and they were able to get the norepinephrine weaned a lot more quickly when methylene blue infusions were used. Uh, maybe the MDW has some utility with identification early of sepsis. Um, it's coming, it looks like in 2026 is um, that the CMS sepsis measure is going to be tied to reimbursement. So stay tuned and really be watching for that. And then hopefully, I think, um, I'm guessing in the next year or two, we'll have updated sepsis guidelines. So again, I want to give another plug to the Sepsis Alliance. They're an amazing nonprofit organization who was started by a gentleman whose 22-year-old daughter died of sepsis and unfortunately it went unrecognized and she passed away at the age of 22. Um, SCCM has got a lot of resources for sepsis and then of course cms.gov and you can actually go on CMS and look at how hospitals are performing. It's called hospital compare and how hospitals are performing with the sepsis measure. Um, the Sepsis Alliance has got tons of free educational resources and um, they're also, they're having a big summit on September 28th and 29th. Um, it's all free. Um, there's subject matter experts from all across the country um, in all spectrums of where patients enter the healthcare system. So there's something for everyone with their summit. So, you know, to get updates from the Sepsis Alliance, um, go to sepsis.org and sign up for their email list. But in conclusion, the this world of sepsis is changing. I don't feel rapidly enough, but it is changing. Uh, you know, we're heading in the right direction. Um, the 2021 Surviving Sepsis Guidelines um, will probably be updated in the next year or two. Watch for um, the CMS core measure and when it gets tied to reimbursement. You know, watch again for the definitions of sepsis and septic shock. Sometimes, you know, insurance companies use one definition and, you know, we base our metrics on another definition. So that's a, something you should always pay attention to. And then the CDC is recommending, you know, that hospitals have sepsis programs, sepsis coordinators, and dedicated time um, of coordinators to spend on sepsis and really looking at how your facility is doing. And, you know, in, in the EMS world, there's definitely this push of giving fluids in the pre-hospital setting. Some EMS agencies are doing point of care lactate out in the field. Some EMS agencies are actually starting antibiotics in the field, but early identification and rapid treatment is absolutely paramount to making a difference. All right, so with that, I'm going to hand it back to Angela. We're going to take questions and then she's going to give you some information on how to get CEs for this webinar. So Angela, take it away. Thank you, Nicole. That was awesome. Um, definitely um, always learn so much when I get to listen to you speak. Just as a reminder, um, continuing education for nurses and EMS professionals and respiratory therapists that this activity has been approved for a 1.0 contact hour. Nurses and RTs need to go to www.saxtesting.com forward slash SL and EMS should go to www.saxtesting.com forward slash EMS. And you will need to register on the test site, complete that evaluation form, and then upon successful submission, you will be able to print off your certificate of completion. Once again, we're thankful for the support of this educational activity. It has been provided by Stryker. There is an archive on demand version that will be available on www.savinglivesnow.org and an email will be sent to all registrants when it is available. 
The on-demand version will be accredited for nurses and respiratory therapists. And now we are gonna to go to our questions. We may decide to go over a little bit if you wanna hang with us um, because we have some great questions in the queue. Um, so let's just start with this first one, um, Nicole. Back to the delirium, someone asked, Russell asked, so is the delirium related back to the infection or the long hospital admission? You know, and Angela, feel free to pipe in as well because just so you all know, Angela is a sepsis expert as well. So. Um, yeah, you know, it definitely could be both. It absolutely could be both. There is definitely mental status changes that happen. Patients can get really foggy, but it's also, you know, being in the hospital. So it could be a syndrome that we see with sepsis leading to delirium, but it also could be everything we do in a hospital. Like we don't let patients sleep, for example. Um, you know, when labs are out of whack, that can lead to delirium. So it definitely could be multifactorial. Getting too much fluid can lead to delirium. It definitely is, is multifactorial and you really need to be using validated tools to identify delirium. So just asking what day is it, what year is it, what time is it does not assess delirium. It's using a validated tool that assesses for inattention and disorganized thinking that you're really going to pick up that you're going to pick up delirium. And a lot of drugs we give are deliriumogenic as well. So, you know, that's it is so, so highly complicated. It really is, it really is, but thanks for that. Um, John asked, do you also see hypotension with severe sepsis? Oh, you can, you can for sure. You know, and I think, um, you know, I mean, technically the definition of septic shock is a MAP less than 65 or a lactate above three, uh, above um, four. But, you know, I will say, you know, when you when they when guidelines are created, they're created to cover about 80% of the population. You know, it's not not everyone's going to fit into a box. And so, one of the things that I think to really pay attention to is patients who have a history of hypertension, especially if their hypertension is not controlled, because a map of 65 would actually be hypotension for a chronically hypertensive patient. So, you know, you've always. I, People will always ask me, so like, what's the best MAP target? And I always jokingly say the one that makes you pee, the one that produces your risk. <laughs> um, but, you know, that it's something to pay attention to in your chronically hypertensive patients. So, you know, technically, when you look at how the definitions are written, severe sepsis is two SIRS or more plus organ dysfunction. So that's that mental fogginess, decreased urine output, a physiologic signs. Technically, hypotension it puts you into a shock definition technically but you know like i said map targets are all relative for sure i think this just brings up the importance of individualized care and treatment don't you think it's not oh, really always just a one size fits all right all right i have some um feedback regarding entitled co2 um, Kathy says, I don't know why we don't measure end tidal CO2 more often on a whole host of patients, especially those receiving opioids. Oh, you're preaching to the choir here. Yes. And you know, I mean, because I am such an advocate for catnography. But, you know, so as an FYI, there was a study that was published in, oh, I'm going to say 2021, where they looked at patients on acute care units and tried to identify, like, who is the, the most high risk? for developing a respiratory depressing event or an RDE. And when they found is there were five criteria. So it was um, being over the age of 60 and male. So stop right there. If you're a male over the age of 60 and you're receiving opioids, you should be receiving capnography 100%. Um, other things were a history of heart failure increases your risk. Being opioid naive increases your risk. And then having sleep apnea but let's be honest like when we ask people do you have sleep apnea a lot of like oh no no no, i'm fine but then you ask their spouse do they, do they have sleep apnea it's like oh, yes, please they just won't go get no testing. so you know but those were the five high risk things and um they actually came up with a validated score and you know i will just say this especially if you're providing if you're providing a procedural sedation in a non-intubated patient and you are not using capnography and a bad event happens, legally, you will not have a leg to stand on. It has been a mandate from the American Society of Anesthesiology since 2010. Capnography is massively over, under, I'm sorry, it's underutilized. Yes. You know, the group that has figured this out is EMS. EMS just gets it. Y'all yes. get it. 
you use capnography and often it's really shameful, but what happens is when you bring them to the emergency department, we take it off. So, you know, I just, I don't know, like, I don't know what it's going to take to get us to use capnography. It's frustrating though. Yeah, for sure. It for sure is. And just to kind of to capitalize on that EMS subgroup, I know one thing we did because where I live is a little bit more rural and we don't have hospitals on every street corner, right? So we really worked with our local EMS departments to work on what you had talked about. And we they can do blood cultures in the field and they can give antibiotics and they can um, they even change the medication out to um, leave a fed from dopamine. So um, I think, a, wouldn't you say that an encouragement to really to reach out to them, they were very open and wanted to do the right thing and really make changes. And they do use entitled CO2 as a surrogate for lactate. Really, really good. Yeah, I can't say enough about that. Absolutely. You know, even asking them to change the fluid type that they're using, because yes. we know that like, like, it doesn't, like, there's not like, patients' outcomes are depending on what happens through the entire trajectory of their healthcare encounter, not just what happens in the hospital or not just what happens in EMS, it's everything. And so, you know, exposure to the acidic fluid with lots of sodium and lots of chloride, no matter where it is, may have an impact on that patient. Yes. And um, the last comments are just in regards to um, lactated ringers or fluids. So any recommendations on how to suggest LR over saline with the care team if they are unaware? And then also, um, are there any specific resources or materials that she could have on hand to facilitate that? And that's from Megan. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think just if you do a quick Google search, what you'll find are the similar and self papers but there's been a meta-analysis on this that the sepsis guidelines actually recommend that you use a balanced fluid over saline. So, you know, there's, there's a, there is a mounting evidence to really support a move away from saline. So, you know, I think just, just doing a quick Google search, you'll find a lot of it and just having the discussion. Cause remember the pH of saline is 5.6. It's got a lot of sodium mm -hmm. and a lot of chloride and all of those things can be, you know, not so helpful to patients, you know, in the setting of sepsis. So true. So true. Well, I guess that wraps it up. Thank you, Nicole. You are so awesome. And I'm going to hand this back over to Tracy, our moderator. Thank you, Angela, and thank you, Nicole, for such a great presentation. We'd like to thank everyone for attending today's webinar. Please note for our survey, immediately upon the conclusion of this webinar, you'll be presented with the online survey. Please keep your web browser open, and we appreciate your feedback. For the CE Certificate of Completion, in one hour following the conclusion of this webinar, you will receive an email with instructions in this link to obtain your CE credits. Nurses and RTs, www.saxtesting.com slash SL and EMS, www.saxtesting.com slash EMS. Thank you very much, and we hope you have a great rest of your day. Mm -hmm.